Have you ever lost confidence that God's way is the best way to live? I worked in an industry for almost six years where my entire income was based solely on the sales that I made. If I sold a lot, I made a lot of money. Some of my workmates were very well off because of it. Unfortunately, it didn't take me long to figure out that a number of the products I was supposed to sell weren't so good, especially for the client. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't have sold them to myself. The problem is that they were the, pro they were the products that would make me the most money, and so it's quite a temptation. On the other hand, there were other really good products that I could sell and that I purchased even myself. The problem was I, I made almost no commission on those products, which is why they were good for the client. The problem was my Christianity. I couldn't, with a clear conscience, sell the products that would have made me good money. Other salespeople all around me were selling them and making great money, but the products were deceptive and so would I have to be. And I knew that that went against my commitment to Christ. It was difficult because after 12 months of commission-only income, I went from having a healthy bank balance to being in substantial debt. My wife, Leonie, and I were going out at the time. Uh, she was at uni and I had to borrow $500 off her just to get through. And I had to marry her so that I didn't have to pay her back. The problem was, here I was, failing, getting further in debt, while others around me were raking it in. And a large part of it was because of my commitment to God. Have you ever lost confidence that God's way is the best way to live? Because you see, to live for God, you have to have confidence that God is good to those who trust him. There would be little point living for God or his way if he wasn't good or if he couldn't be trusted. But see, here's the point the psalmist wants to make right up front in this psalm he's written. Verse 1, he says, Truly God is good to Israel to his people, to those who are pure in heart and trust him. However, the psalmist wasn't always so confident. He tells here of a time when he doubted God's goodness, when he doubted that God's way was the best way to live. It's a fascinating testimony. And perhaps there have been times when you have doubted God's goodness to you, when you've doubted whether living his way is the best. And perhaps you're struggling with the issue right at this very moment. And if so, I trust that before we finish here today, you will come to see what the psalmist discovered, that truly God is good to those who are pure in heart. And by pure in heart, he means those who would have a single mind towards God. Well, there may be a variety of reasons why people lose confidence that God's ways are the best. But for the psalmist, he focuses in on an issue that caused him to doubt God's ways. In verse 2, the psalmist says he had almost slipped and his problem was envying the wicked. More specifically, he envied the arrogance and prosperity of the wicked. Let's have a, a look at it again from verse 2. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are, they are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with follies, they scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. In the psalmist's experience, as he looked around, he saw that there were wicked people who prospered. And then after the experience comes envy. See there in verse 3, first he sees the prosperity of the wicked, then it leads him to envy he begins to evaluate himself against them. In verses 4 to 11, he describes what the wicked are like. Theirs is the good life. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're proud and arrogant. They oppress and exploit the poor and weak. Their speech is perverse and proud. And I love the way he puts it there in verse 9. Their tongue struts through the earth. As well as that, people follow them because of their influence and power. It's a great example of how when we take our eyes off God and look at others, greed and jealousy begin to rule our life. His whole perspective had become screwed up. And verses 4 and 5 illustrate just how far off track his envy took him. He actually sees the impossible taking place. The wealthy wicked have no pangs until death. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Now, it's likely that all of us can think of wicked individuals who prosper, but we would be fools to think that all who are wicked prosper. I mean, that's clearly not true. 
There have been no shortage of chronic gamblers who have lost all their wealth to a pack of cards down at the TAB or through an online gambling habit. There are those who, by their drunkenness, have lost their families. Now, wickedness will often lead to ruin as much as it leads to prosperity. However, what the psalmist is describing here is those who prosper, not in spite of their wickedness, but because of their wickedness. And he begins to question himself in verse 13. Have I wasted my time living God's way? Has keeping my heart pure been for no purpose, all in vain? They move forward, I don't. There's a danger of becoming cynical, of beginning to think that there's no other way of getting ahead. And maybe you've personally had the same experience as our psalmist describes, where you see others with dodgy practices making progress and getting ahead financially or in other ways while you struggle. They're buying or building bigger homes while you struggle to make the repayments. They're buying flash new cars while you're trying to keep yours running. They're eating out regularly at fancy restaurants. You've got to work out whether you're breaking the budget to buy a real coffee once in a while. They're regularly heading, perhaps overseas, to lavish holiday destinations. And you're not sure if you can really afford to go away on holidays this year. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30 says, Envy makes the bones rot. It's an important reminder to us. Seeing people that are better off than us can often lead us into despair. However, the greater danger is that it will lead us to lose confidence in God and his ways. The psalmist had seen the wicked prosper because of his wickedness and it had caused him to question God's goodness to him. But he was wrong. His perspective on the situation was wrong. He needed a new perspective, which is exactly what God gave him in verses 16 and following. Have a look again at verse 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. See, this issue weighed him down. It, it oppressed him. He, he couldn't stop thinking about it. Why do those who live God's way, who try and do the right thing, why do they lose out? He couldn't understand it. That is, until he entered God's sanctuary. He couldn't understand it until then. And it was then that he understood their end. That is, what the end is for those who are wicked. He doesn't tell us exactly what happened in the Lord's sanctuary that enabled him to understand. Possibly it was the daily rituals that were performed, the sacrifices that were offered for the sins of the people that were intended to remind God's people that he takes our sin seriously and that he will punish sin in those who fail to repent and turn to him for forgiveness. Maybe it was simply as he meditated on the character of God. We don't know exactly, but when he entered God's sanctuary, he saw things from God's perspective. He saw their end in light of God's judgment, which is described in verses 18 to 20. The psalmist hadn't evaluated what he saw the wicked achieving in light of the big picture. But God gives him back his perspective. The wicked are standing on slippery ground, verse 18. Their short-term wealth and power is like a dream, verse 20. When they awake, it vanishes. In fact, it never really was what it seemed. And when their end comes, it will mean nothing. It will have achieved nothing. Nothing, that is, of lasting value. They will be swept away by God's judgment. See, your understanding of the end changes your entire perspective. And in verses 17 to 20, the psalmist comes to a true conclusion. In the end, we must all face God's judgment. And it's that true conclusion that leads him to a new conclusion in the final verses, in verses 21. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. His new conclusions, once God had put things into perspective for him, was that when I was envying the wicked, I was being stupid. He had allowed it to embitter him. How senseless and ignorant we are. I mean, because it's not just the psalmist who had allowed himself to envy the wicked and the wealth that it sometimes brought them. We so often fail in the exact same way. As Christians, we're supposed to understand that it's not this world that we live for. We live for the glory and wealth and perfection of heaven. The problem is, too often we lose perspective. We allow the small thing to become huge, when instead we should get the small things, like the wealth of the wicked, into the perspective of the big. And that's what the psalmist does in these final verses. Verse 23, he recognises that we are never alone. God never leaves us. He is always holding us by the hand. Verse 24, God guides his people, those who are pure in heart. 
and he will receive them into his eternal glory. Verses 25 and 26, he realizes that when it comes down to it, who else is there but God alone? Who else is there that can welcome him into heaven? Who else can sustain him on earth? Who else will remain his strength when his physical and mental powers fail? I mean, in the end, we all know that earthly treasures will fail. We've seen it. We're seeing it right now as our world rise under the burden of this pandemic. People are not only losing lives and loved ones, people are losing livelihoods. The hopes and dreams they have invested so much of themselves in are evaporating before them. This is an enormous wake-up call for a society that thinks it's in control, that, lives, uh, that lives only for the treasures and pleasures of this world. We're not in control. Our earthly treasures are fleeting, but there's eternal blessing for those in God's presence. That's what he concludes in verse 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Well, for the psalmist, his confidence was restored when he entered the sanctuary and began to see things from God's perspective. For us, the psalmist helps us to see two truths that restore the confidence of believers. The first doesn't seem confidence restoring, but it is. That is, first, we live in a fallen world. The psalmist reminds us that it's a reality. In this world where God is marginalised, godly people will suffer. Hard times will come. God's people are not immune from suffering or pain or being mistreated or missing out on good things in this world at times. That may not sound confidence restoring, but it is. One of the biggest problems for Christians is when they have a faulty understanding of what God promises us in this world. I mean, if we think that by living God's way, God will shield us from pain and bless all of our efforts with success, then we'll be shattered when he fails to deliver. Our confidence in him and his ways will be shattered, and then that is a problem. You know, we can't expect from God what he never promises us in the world. Of course we can't expect, sorry, of course we can expect those things in the next world but the psalmist's confidence in God was tested because he had a wrong perspective. You know, I went to work in that commission-based job because I wanted to make more money, and I was promised that I would. But God didn't promise that to me. The guy who made the promise was the one who wanted to increase his staff because he got more commission if he did. I worked long hours watching people doing the wrong thing, getting rich while I was falling apart financially. But God didn't let me down. In fact, he taught me what it was probably one of the most important lessons of my Christian life. I didn't make much money, but God blessed me in ways I could never have foreseen. He taught me to trust him, not my money or success. He taught me not to have wrong expectations of him in this world. Because it only leads us to lose confidence in the one person we can truly have confidence in, even when things are bad. And so the first truth is that we live in a fallen world and hard times will come. The second truth is that it is better to be going through very hard times and be near to God than having a great time as God's enemy. The psalmist came to understand that the wicked are on slippery ground and with an understanding of their end, with the perspective of God's judgment, he realised how foolish his envying of the wicked was and how good it is to be near to God. His confidence was restored and so can yours be. That is, of course, if you're one of those who are pure in heart. Any confidence that the wicked have is misplaced because they are destined for God's judgment. The goodness of God is, as verse 1 makes clear, for his people, that is, for those who are pure in heart. We, we can't, therefore, leave this passage without answering that question, who are the pure in heart? It's a good question. And the, for the answer to that, one of the places we can look is in Acts chapter 15, verses 8 to 9. We'll come to it in a minute. But in verse 1 of Psalm 73, we're told that truly God is good to Israel, who are then further defined as the pure in heart. Now, most of us aren't Israelites, so therefore does this psalm apply to us at all, us non-Jews, us Gentiles? Well, yes, it does. I mean, the Jews were God's chosen people, and they were to show that by their single-minded devotion towards God and to be seen in the purity of their hearts and minds before God and man. Well, this passage in Acts is dealing with this exact issue, uh, whether or not non-Jews, like us, can be regarded as those whom God accepts and loves as his own people. Have a look at what the Apostle Peter, who is a Jew, says at this important council in Jerusalem, uh, known famously as the Jerusalem Council. Uh, verse 8 of chapter 15. 
And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. That is, thousands of Gentiles had been putting their faith in Jesus and becoming Christians. It was a new stage in God's intention to save humanity from their sin, and the Apostle Peter recognised that. He points out that God knows the heart of all people, and that he had made no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, because he had cleansed or purified their hearts by faith. That is, those who put their trust in Jesus Christ are those who are pure in heart. God cleanses our hearts when we put our faith in Jesus. Truly, God is good to all those who have had their hearts purified by putting their trust in Jesus. Is that you? That's the first question I, I want to ask you today. Are you one who knows and has accepted the goodness of God towards you? Do you know his presence with you always? Are you aware of his guidance? Are you one whom he will receive into glory with him for all eternity? Do you experience his love and strength and faithfulness towards you as one of his own people? Or do you need to have your heart cleansed by God? Because he'll do it today if you want him to. The second question is for those who claim to trust Jesus. Where are you personally tempted to envy the wicked? Is there an area that causes you to stumble? Are there any areas that cause you to doubt the goodness of God and his ways? Are there areas of your life where, you're, where living Christianly is jeopardising you or is restricting what you do or want to achieve? It can happen in your career. Sometimes living God's way could hold you back. Perhaps in your relationships, making a godly choice for a spouse may require you to step away from a relationship you really want. Perhaps your faithfulness to your spouse in obedience to God will prevent you from having that harmless fling on the side that so many others are having, but which is never really harmless. No doubt you know if and what other ways you are tempted to envy the wicked. And so you need to take to heart the psalmist's candid testimony today. You need to see things from God's perspective with an appropriate understanding of the end and have your confidence restored in the goodness of God towards you. And then you'll be able to say with him, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I might tell of all your works. Who or what are you placing your confidence in? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for the wonderful reminder that you are a good God, that you love us, that the things that you have promised for us are good. You don't promise us no trouble in this world as if things will just go on and on and that we as those who believe in you will never face the burdens that this world faces. We know that we live in a fallen world, but you are a good God who has promised us hope through the Lord Jesus Christ, purified hearts, relationship with you, and eternal life that can never be taken away from us. So, Father, we pray today that you might continue to um, reveal to us what is true in this world. For those who don't know the Lord Jesus, who are wondering what this God is and, and whether he can be trusted and whether he even exists, we pray, Lord God, that you would open their hearts to know you and to understand that you care for them, that you are their creator and that you want to rescue them and bring them into your family. And Father, for those of us who know that rescue, who have been saved by the blood of Jesus who died on the cross for us, we pray, Lord God, that we would live this life confident in your goodness towards us. Know that our hope is in you so that as we live life, that we would do it looking out for the needs of others and not simply our own needs. And in a world that is struggling right now, with so many difficulties that are going on, where people are losing their life, where people are fighting on the front line and they are tired and they are weary, for our governments who are burdened day by day, seeking to do what is good for their people, Lord God, be with each one of them, strengthen them, Enable them to make good and wise and, and worthwhile decisions for everyone. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep us from the ongoing struggle uh, that this pandemic faces and that you'll care for those, Father, who are in most need at this time. And we ask all of these things through you, our good and loving Heavenly Father. Amen.